Hi guys, how's everyone doing? Thanks for joining me for another Saturday set of stories. I've got four viewers stories today, four stories that have been sent in by viewers, all true stories we hope, uh, and I'm going to be reading them out for you today. Right, before we get into it, um, I think I'm going to stick with this radio mic. Do you remember last week I told you I'd kind of upgraded, I was using a plug-in lavender mic, they call, they're called lavender mics, and uh, that was on my old S10, and I asked for a little bit of feedback now that I'm using this radio mic and I'm, my new S22+, uh, Plus. well it's not new but it's an upgrade and most of the feedback I've got from you guys is the sound is good enough if not better one guy wrote to me and said it's not as clear but that could be from his end so I'm going to stick with it it's there's no cables or anything so it's a lot better uh, some people don't like me mentioning this but I'm going to mention it because I find it really funny you know I'm always going on about the uh, the fashion police you know I've had guys write to me and they say they don't like my shirt or my shirt's too bright or my hairstyle's all wrong I mean it's crazy stuff isn't it people like to say to me when I meet them you know do people really you know, do they really write those comments? And they really do. And last week I'd said all was good in the world because I hadn't had any comments from the fashion police. And this week, okay, I printed it out for you. This is a comment I got today. And this is from a guy called Rick Tellick. And I swear, guys, I'm not making this up, right? This was in my comments. It's probably, you probably see it if you look under the comments, right? It says, Peter, respectfully, throw that hat in the rubbish bin. Do you sleep in it? or something. I don't know what he means by something, but no, I don't sleep in it. Uh, but I don't feel I, should, I need to explain myself about why I wear a hat. Hot country, bright sunshine, I don't do shades, okay? Nothing more than that. I wanted to share my story on how and why I recently went to Thailand. I got married right out of high school and was married for 12 years before getting divorced in 1996. After getting divorced, I kind of went crazy with the United States version of freelance girls, in brackets, street girls, meeting up with at least a few a week. The USA freelance girls never really tell the truth, but just enough to get you to come and see them again. My funniest story was when I picked up a girl one day while it was raining. She got into my car and I commented on how wet her hair was and she replied, oh, I just got out of the shower. She wasn't really happy when I asked if she got in the shower with her clothes on because they were soaked too. Jump into 2000 and 2004 and I'm now 38 years old. I got married to a girl 19 years younger than me. It started off great but then the spark gone and after only a couple of years but we stayed married for 15 years but got divorced in 2019. Just before the pandemic hit. I have been married for a total of 27 years to two different wives, divorced twice and never had any children. Still, at this point, I've never even considered a trip to Thailand. Now in the USA, there have been measures to keep girls off the streets and what girls you can find on certain websites charge crazy high prices and the girls' looks have now gone. I had gone to Mexico and met up with a girl, in brackets freelancer, by their standards, but was not really that great. The next trip was to the Dominion Republic, which I heard was a place to go for those who live in the USA. The Republic has a large freelance population. I met a couple of girls there, but things were all the same with each one. They ran out of steam very quickly, then just begged for more money and more of a tip. I met one girl at a club that seemed to be working for someone. The girl gave me her number secretly and told me to call her and we could meet outside the club. We exchanged one quick message but I never reached out to her to meet her again. Fast forward to six months later and I get a text from the club owner who said I owed him $600 because I met his girl outside the club and if I didn't pay, he would hunt me down and harm me and my family. I replied to him that I never met his girl and if he contacted me again I would report him to the authorities. I never did hear from him again. Now it's summer of 2022 and most of the COVID restrictions have been removed and I was looking for a place to holiday and meet some girls. A friend of mine suggested that Thailand was where I really needed to go. He had never been there but he assured me it was what I was looking for and that it was safe. Thailand is 20 hours of flying and I wasn't sure I could even handle being on a flight that long but I figured why not I can give it a try. So I booked my trip for March 2023 and I started doing as much research as I could. I started watching a lot of your videos and a few others too and all I could think of was I have gotten in, have I got in over my head? 
I've had a lot of experience with girls, but the Thailand girls seem to be very good at making men feel fall in love with them. I bought a subscription to Thai Friendly and I started talking to a few girls. A lot of girls on Thai Friendly only want to talk if you are currently there. I mostly only talked to freelance girls and got a few details from them and told them I wouldn't waste their time and I would reach out to them when I arrived. I went with a friend and we met an Aussie guy at a restaurant when we, when we first got there. We made plans to go out that night and hit a few bars. Now keep in mind 20 hours of flying and a 10 hour layover and I worked a 10 hour shift right before heading to the airport. Needless to say that all that caught up with me and I felt like crap for two days. I stayed the first week in Bangkok and the second week in Patong. While out at the bar the first night I saw, a girl, I saw a girl who I was interested in and I was sure she was a girl and not a lady boy but the Aussie guy seemed to think she wasn't a lady at all only because she was a little tall. I went home alone that night mostly because I had to start recovering from the travelling. The sights and sounds and smells of Thailand are amazing and something you just don't see anywhere else. The next few nights I had female company from a few other different girls and I can say why I can see why so many men go to Thailand. The girls are amazing, they are very loving and very much want to make you happy. They're a bit shy in some cases which comes across as sexy at the same time. The girls I met up with showed showed me around the temples, the night market and Terminal 21. None of them asked or hinted for me to buy them anything which I fully expected from watching lots of videos. The only exception was for me to buy them meals and none of them ever took advantage by ordering everything on the menu. So all in all, Bangkok was amazing. Now, off to my week in Patong in Phuket. Our hotel was a half block from Bangla Road. In Patong, our hotel has a swimming pool, so we de decided to relax by the pool and make our plans for the evening. I was a bit surprised at first that there were only men at the pool, but after thinking about it, we all went there for the same reason, and our hotel was only booked by men on holiday looking for companions. I'm not much of a drinker, so sitting in a bar is not really for me. While walking down Bangla Road at night, there are a million things to look at, and I was getting a bit annoyed at all the people pulling on you, putting signs in your face and putting cell phones right up in your eyes to get you to go into their bars. I had met a few girls in Patong who were freelancers and everything was great. One of the girls went to PP Island with me on a day trip and we had a great time. On the last night, my friend and I went to see the Fantasy Sea Show and had dinner there. The, the place seemed mostly for kids but the food and the show were very good with elephants and lots of other animals. After the show, I had made arrangements to meet a girl at my hotel for a little fun on my last night. Only getting to see her pictures on Thai Friendly, she seemed very beautiful, but she seemed very tall. I asked if she was a ladyboy and she assured me she was not, so our, plan, our plans were set. She arrived on Thai time, so she was a bit late. I almost didn't expect her to turn up because it was almost 1am. When she showed up, she looked to be about 188 centimetres tall, and to my surprise, she had brought a girlfriend with her who was about 180 centimetres tall. Both were 100% ladies and very beautiful. I had a great last night in Patong. Now back in the USA, it's the same old thing. Older and middle-aged, overweight women who are bitter and have unrealistic expe expectations of the men they are looking for. It is sad to say, but since my trip to Thailand, I have no desire to date women here in the USA. I have been home for two months now and I've already booked my flight in November 2023 the Saturday after Thanksgiving, and this time it will be one week in Pattaya and one week in Patong, hoping to see my tall girls again. I have every intention of retiring in Thailand when the time comes. I love it there and can see myself having a great time. One girl I'd met in Bangkok I really did click with, mainly because she was just a sweet person. Her name is Tip. She is a supervisor in a hotel and has been working there for a number of years. She's 40 years old but looks much younger. I would guess that she only meets once in a while for a little extra money since she has a full-time job. We have messaged a few times since I have been home and she never mentioned money or sick buffalo or medical bills. I have some plans next April here in the USA so I asked if she could join me and she could visit the USA for three weeks. It's not 
a falling in love thing, but mostly we get on very well. And I wouldn't like, I'd like to spend a little more time with her. She is going to look into a travel visa, but I hear they are hard to get for Thai women. Not very expensive, but just hard to get. No crash and burn story, but I just thought it was interesting how I found my way to Thailand and how I can't wait to return. The land of smiles is really just that. Okay, great little story there. So this kind of, you know, gets me thinking a little bit. I don't want to be one of these in the old days. Everything was better in the old days. But, you know, there are thousands upon thousands of guys arriving in Thailand now because it's all over the internet. Uh, there's nothing hidden any longer. You know, you can find out all the information. You can watch lots and lots of YouTube videos. And there are a lot of guys around the world. They can't find uh, female company in their own company, in their own country rather, uh, and they head out here. And that, that's not such a bad thing, but the point I was trying to make was, I can remember kind of like 30 years ago, before it was all on the internet and you had all the infrastructure that's in place now, it was totally, totally different. It was, it was kind of, uh, Patia was a kind of place you went and kept it to yourself, you know. It wasn't, uh, you know, the huge city that it is today. You had some bars on the beach road and a few of the Soy 7, Soy 8, and of course Walking Street was there, but it wasn't as elaborate as it is today, all neon. It's a little bit like Las Vegas, isn't it? Or Times Square, Piccadilly Circus, something like that. It was all it was all done on the cheap back then. Um, that's just me waffling, re reminiscing a little bit, but good story. Let's jump straight into number two. I'm a younger guy in his early 30s from Scotland, UK. Over the past five or six years, I started to get interested in traveling to Asia after watching 90 Day Fiance one night, believe it or not. I was intrigued about how traditional Asian, Asian women were portrayed. During the COVID lockdown, I was still working, but I found your channel and from there branched off into many other Thailand YouTubers and started watching everything I could. At the time, I was in a long-term relationship and I knew I would never really get the chance to travel solo, but after watching so many Thailand videos, I guess I got the bug. My relationship sadly broke down at the start of last year, 2022. So newly single and feeling sorrow, sorry for myself, what did I do? I booked a trip to Thailand, a whole month in Pattaya. It was my first time traveling so far away and first time solo, so I was pretty apprehensive. I got all my accommodation booked, followed your, you and other YouTubers' advice on where to stay, things to be careful of, and where to change money, etc. And off I went on two seven-hour flights ahead of me, and feeling both excited and worried if I'd made a mistake that I'd regret. When I arrived, I had to wait around two hours to get through the lengthy immigration queue, and man, that heat was crazy. Being from Scotland, I really wasn't used to it. Immigration took all of 10 seconds once at the front of the queue and I headed straight for the lower floor to change some pounds to bar. I had already preloaded an eSIM in my phone and was ready for Thailand. I had booked a pretty cheap lady taxi from the airport to Pattaya, where the lady met me at arrivals. After a quick 7-Eleven visit for a well-needed drink, off I went to Pattaya. Once I arrived and checked in, I decided to go for a walk around the area. I was staying near the Soy Bacau. Straight away, I was blown away by the sheer number of bars, massage shops and girls that are everywhere, but I wasn't complaining. I had heard that no lady is free in Pattaya and was determined to prove that wrong. I'm a pretty fit guy who frequents the gym and I was feeling pretty good from the compliments and the girls gave me. Such a contrast to the UK. After the walkabout, I went back to my hotel for a quick shower and headed back out, this time towards Soy 7. I had been chatting to a girl from Thai Friendly who worked in a bar there and thought it was as good as many places to start. Turns out she wasn't 100% a she and was in fact a ladyboy, but wow, was it difficult to tell. At least for me anyway. She was gorgeous all the same, and I'm not afraid to say it, but I tried. The next day, I woke up pretty late and after a heavy night on the booze and I headed for Soy Bacau again. I wanted to shop around as it were and just wander about and see what was going on. I didn't get very far when a pretty stunning girl, let's call her B, sat outside a bar and asked me where I was going and if she could come. I ended up in her bar buying her drinks and playing pool. The usual stuff. I suppose. I fell into the bar girl trap somewhat because I ended up spending around a week with her, bar finding her every morning to keep her around. She'd only been in her bar for a month or so, she said, but given her relative inexperience and the fact that she was only 21, I had no real reason to doubt that. 
In any case, I wasn't really too fussed because I wasn't looking for anything serious. I ended up meeting quite a few friends from her bar who I'm still in touch with. Fast forward a week or so and a friend had told me to try Soy 6. So I did. I lost count of the number of times I was grabbed there, but what an experience. I met several girls who all wanted my line ID, wanted to meet me after they finished and go to walking street. I ended up bar finding a couple which I managed to haggle down to a thousand baht. Two of the girls apparently fell in love with me and were relentlessly messaging and would storm out of their bars over to me any time I went down Soy 6. One of them, we'll call her Om, actually turned up at my hotel after she finished one night. Never once did either ask for any money from me. I wasn't fully aware of telling girls you're a butterfly. After a week of Soy 6 madness, I decided to let the heat died down a bit and go for another wander, this time around second road, I think it was. I stumbled down a small soy and found a bar with, again, hotties accosting me. I gave in and went for a drink. It was close to closing time and one of the girls, Jay, wanted to come with me. I agreed. All the while, B had been messaging and calling me non-stop. After, after a bit of fun, I decided to go meet B and figure I should give her the I'm a butterfly chat well, Jay just so happened to live on Soy Bacal, so wanted to walk with me. Being a drunken idiot, I agreed and we walked towards Soy, soy Bacal and kept, kept asking where her soy was. She told me it wasn't far and was the next right turn. I was conscious that we were getting closer to B's bar, but from what I had heard and understood, Jay would be going down a soy before B's bar. All good. Well, she didn't. B was outside of her bar with her friends and a friend of mine. They all seen me. B and her friend immediately ran towards me shouting and screaming all sorts of stuff in Thai. I honestly thought I was about to get a smack in the face. Poor Jay, I looked pretty horrified at what was happening and um, was also the brunt of whatever was said in Thai. I assume it wasn't very pleasant. I felt pretty bad. I'm an idiot. I know. Being drunk did not help matters. Thankfully, my friend was able to hold them both back whilst I made good my escape. I had apparently failed to realise that Thai girls assume you are theirs unless otherwise stated, and it's a mistake I certainly won't make again. I suppose I didn't help myself by spending so much time for her. From now on, unless I'm looking for someone serious, I make sure to be clear that I'm a butterfly. I don't want to get on the bad side of Thai girls. Needless to say, I avoided the bar for the remainder of my stay. For any newcomers to Pattaya or any other place in Thailand, I suppose they should be aware of telling girls they're a butterfly unless they are after just one girl. It will save many headaches and heartaches. Also, another thing I would say I learnt was to withdraw a week or a few days worth of money from an ATM. I made the stupid mistake of withdrawing 100 to 200 pound a day and of course the five pound ATM fees soon added up. I'm all set for my next trip back in Pattaya and I honestly can't wait. I've decided to give up everything in the UK and move out to Thailand as soon as I can. P.S. Keep up the good work, Peter. Your insights and experience are very helpful to the younger crowd too. Take the notice of the moaners. I couldn't really care less what you wear or if you waffle, we'll watch for your waffling. It's part of what makes your videos unique, giving us your opinion and taking on the matter, taking on matters. So please don't stop waffling all the best. Quite complimentary there, so I will have a little bit of a waffle now. Um, so with this guy, he did state that he was he was quite young at the time. He was about 30. I don't know how old he is now. I'm guessing not much more than 30, but he's he said here he's going to come out full time. I don't know how he's going to do that because obviously you need to be 50 plus to get a retirement visa and you know any other kind of visa when you're under 50 the only way you can really stay out here long term as if you're employed by a company or you have a business which is quite difficult to do by yourself um, so I'd, I'd really be interested in that one and what he's talking about with the uh, the ATM machines there uh, just a quick reminder I'm, I'm sure you all know this but every time you use a, a foreign debit or credit card in a local ATM machine here they charge you 220 baht the equivalent of five pounds or six US dollars uh, it doesn't matter whether you take 1,000 baht out or 30 thousand but uh, that static charges there so like he said you know if you come here and you need some cash take out 20,000 baht you know and you can always take it back with you whatever um okay so um 
How many more we got? Right, the next two stories are from the same guy. Uh, he's Swedish, so English isn't his mother tongue, so I've cleaned it up as best as I can, and I think it'll read okay. Uh, there's a few lessons to be learned in here. He got scammed. Uh, he'll tell you about that in his second story, and his first story is about problems he had with his e-visa, uh, which are quite interesting, and you should prick your ears up if you're one of those guys who are going to go for one of these types of visas. My story in Southeast Asia goes back to early 1970s, but I think it is easier to take them in reverse order and the memory will gradually come back to me. I'm a 70-year-old Swedish guy, but most Asian girls guess that I'm between 47 and 52. They usually do not believe me, so I have to take out my French driving license to prove my age. Usually they get a shock when they see it. I don't go to, to the gym, but I eat healthy and I try to walk at least 10,000 steps a day. For tax reasons, I have been a French taxpayer since September 2016, so I reduced my tax for my Swedish pension from 33% to 3.4%. That's why hundreds of thousands of Swedes move to the Riviera when they retire. When the pandemic started in early 2020, my daughter, who lives in Vancouver, said, Dad, you have to leave China now. To make a long story short, I spent two and a half years in France, which was like living in a prison. The only good thing I can say about France is that the cheese and the wine is great, and the speed and parking tickets and personal tax is very low. It is also very fast to get over to the UK via the Eurotunnel. My initial plan was to get back to China as soon as they opened the borders again. But for reasons I will explain in my next story, it was not realistic. I decided to move to Thailand. So... Well, before Christmas last year, I applied for an e-visa of the OA type from the Thai Embassy in Paris. Yes, you have to apply from the country of residence. I warn everybody who can avoid it, do not apply for a Thai visa from France. I sold my Swedish registered Saab to a guy in Paris and got the same money I paid for it in Sweden three years earlier. I booked my flight from Paris to Bangkok with Thai Air on the 23rd of January. I brought the required health insurance for Thailand, got the health certificate, resigned from my apartment, etc. I thought I was set to go, but no. The staff at the Thai embassy in Paris said that I have been staying for too long in France. Why make it easy when you can make it difficult? Less than one week before I was leaving, they contacted me and said that in France, we do not accept a monthly income equal of 65,000 baht plus. You must have at least equivalent of 800,000 baht in your bank account. I did not have that kind of money, so I got a bit de desperate and sent an email to the Thai embassy in Stockholm with a copy of the Thai embassy in Paris asking if my e-visa application could be transferred to Stockholm. That made the Thais in Paris wake up. They contacted me and said if I could have my Swedish bank write an official letter stating my monthly income converted into euro, they would grant me the visa. I fixed that in three days and thought everything was okay. Of course my visa was not okay. I stayed overnight at a hotel near the CDG airport in Paris while I was waiting for the shuttle bus to the airport. A nice Thai girl from the embassy called me and said, I'm sorry, but my boss wants to see your criminal record from France as well. Normally for OA visa, a criminal record from the country of your citizenship is enough. I said, I have no internet now and I must catch the bus. The girl from the embassy kept calling me every 30 minutes. Finally, I had checked in and found a bar to sit down and hooked up to the super slow airport inter internet. I had the girl from the embassy on my phone all the time and she guided me through the procedure to download my criminal record from France. Finally, it was finished and she was satisfied but it was only one hour before my flight was leaving. The girl said, we, do, we don't have time to issue a visa in one hour, so please check your email when you have landed in Bangkok. I checked my email and my visa was there to my relief. By the way, the girl at the embassy said that I am the only one ever that got an OA visa from the embassy in France because of my income. When I arrived at the immigration counter in Bangkok, I just showed the e-visa on my phone and everything was fine. The lady at the airport immigration took the time to explain to me how the visa worked. I was a bit tired after the trip, so she had to explain several times. She said I did not have to do anything until next year. And if I left the kingdom before the visa expired and returned before the day of expiry, I could stay another year without having to apply again. I thought that was the end of the visa business, 
But no, there's more. Last week, I casually watched a YouTube video about a Thai visas. It showed that you have to report to the immigration after every 90 days. I thought that was strange as the immigration lady at the airport had said that I did not have to do anything until next year. I checked on the Thai immigration website and apparently it was correct. So I went to the immigration last Friday and spent all afternoon there for nothing. They did not accept my rental contract. Coming back home, I met the landlady and also another foreign tenant, a foreign girl that has been living in Thailand for about eight years so she knows how to handle things with the immigration. She told me the landlady that she she told the landlady that she just had to fill in and sign a TMZ30 form and give it to me and she only had to do it once. The landlady promised to do it during the weekend and give it to me today. When I had not received it by 10 a.m. this morning, I called the landlady who hardly understands or speaks any English. She said she sent a photo by line. I could print it out. I sent back a message translated to Thai by Google Translate. Does not the immigration require your original signature on the document? Then she called back again and said she should send, she'll send a signed signature from my line and I could print it out. After she said that, I literally exploded into a rage and shouted loud to her in the telephone. She should have reported my stay to immigration four months ago after I moved in. I heard nothing for about an hour, but then I got a screenshot showing, showing she had reported my stay online. So obviously it helped to get angry with her. I went to the immigration to report my 90 day stay and everything went smoothly except they charged me 2000 baht for reporting one month late. That made me very annoyed as the immigration officer in the airport had said that I did not have to do anything until next year. I also think they normally staple some kind of a slip on the passport page with a stamp on it. Therefore, it was impossible for me to know that I had to do the 90 day report. Next time I can report the 90 days online. Okay, look, before we get into the next story, I've got quite a bit of advice on this on this visa thing, okay? So, you know, you do, when you're on any kind of long-term visa in Thailand, you have to report every 90 days to immigration, okay? In the old days, and a lot of people still don't know about this, you had to traipse down to immigration, queue up, for the best part of an afternoon or a morning uh, in Pattaya, they've now built uh, an enclosed um, waiting area with seating and air conditioning. But it, before that, it's, it's literally, they're just opening it now. But before that, you had to stand in the hot sun under a canopy all day and it, were, it was brutal, real brutal apparently. But you can actually do it online now. So I've, I've actually been here six months on my visa now and I had to report three uh, months ago nearly. I next have to report on June the 24th. You've got seven days either way up or it's seven and 40. I'm not, you'd have to look that up for yourself, but at least seven days. So I'll try and remember to put a link in this uh, description of this. And if you're interested in having the online version, if you just go onto the Thai immigration website, it's really hard to find the link because you click a box and it opens up and it looks like it's not that and you close it and it's impossible to find. Somebody help me find it. But all they want to know is your visa number, your current address, you send that in and within a day or 48 hours later, they send you an email confirming that they've accepted your 90 day report. And all you do is you keep that email and obviously when you're leaving, you might wanna print them out. But I've done it, it works. And I, uh, when I did it online, I got the confirmation. And if you remember, I went back to the UK to sell my house and there was no issues at the airport about the 90 day reporting. Uh, and, and I'll do it again online. So there's several ways you can do it. You can either go down there yourself and queue up, okay, which isn't nice. You can pay an agent uh, a couple of hundred baht, that's all it is, they'll do it for you. But there's no there's no need. You just go online, put in your visa number uh, and also um, your, your current address, okay? So okay, I was gonna say this, this is a comment, quite a lengthy comment that I got. Now that we're talking about visas here, I think it's important that I read this out to you. I'm gonna be reading this out again on my live stream next week because I'm with Marley tonight. Uh, well, that'll be tonight actually by the time you get this one. I'm going to be reading this out again on my live stream this evening, but this is a, a comment that somebody left me. So if, if you, you know, don't, with visas and immigration now, it used to be so easy going, you could do whatever you want, but it, they've tightened the law so much now. Um, what they've recently done, people who are here on kind of charitable visas, younger guys, you know, 30s, they want to stay here, they're on charity visas or on the education visas, you know, they've gone around to the schools and the charities and, you know, people have been deported. But this is a, a comment that somebody sent me and it should be a warning to you. If you're one of those guys who thinks that you can stay here for six months to a year or next to for forever on just going out of the country on short trips, uh, you better wake up, have a listen to this. Hey Peter, great video. I made a huge mistake. I came into 
Thailand on January 3, 2023 on a 40 day visa. That's obviously during when they were doing the promotion and they upped it from 30 days to 45. Okay, he's coming on the 45. I ex extended it for 30 days and I did two border runs to Cambodia. Then I flew out to Malaysia. I came back expecting a 30 day visa stamp and was rejected and deported. My intention was to get a 15 month retirement visa, but my mistake was taking advice from an agent that was wrong. If you max out your extensions and border runs, time immigration frowns on that. Imagine this, I just bought a backpack with me to Malaysia, leaving all of the rest of my stuff at my hotel in Jomtim. So I'm currently stuck in Malaysia and have no answer as to when I can return to Thailand. Please share with your subscribers in capitals. Do not enter and exit Thailand more than three times because you will be deported. I didn't overstay. I was allowed 180 days on a tourist visa, visa but what the agency failed to tell me was that if you re-enter more than three times you will get deported and they do not tell you when you can come back okay so that's real serious because i know guys again in the old days they, they lived here forever they just they took a bus to cambodia every 30 days and there was you know as long as they had a visa when they, they got the stamp coming in no problem but you know they're clamping down on all this stuff now uh, and if you're one of these people and you don't do it properly and you think you can stay here long term on on a tourist visit you just can't do it guys okay do it the right way then you can come back you can get a, an, a 60 day visa in your own country from the thai embassy you come out here you can extend it for a further 30 days if you want to stay again perhaps do one border run okay but don't max it out because you like the guy said you're going to get deported and you don't know when you'll be able to come back if ever okay so let's go into our uh, fourth and final story and again this is from the same swedish guy uh, he talks a little bit about the visas again then he goes on uh, into the scam first a little follow-up from my last story I don't want any more problems with Thai immigration, so I want to be 100% sure that I can stay two years in Thailand on a one-year OA visa. A Swedish friend in Hua Hin had confirmed it, but I wanted more reassurance, so I asked the lady at the immigration who handled my 90-day report. Her English was so bad, so I do not even think she understood my question. So I searched the internet, and there is absolutely nowhere you can find the exact information on how the OA visa works. So I asked in a Thai Swedish forum, within a couple of minutes I got similar replies from two people. If you have an OA visa with multiple stamp every time you enter Thailand, you're allowed to stay for 12 months from that date. That means that if you return no later than the date of ex expiry, you, in you can stay in Thailand two years on a one year visa. If you want to take a trip abroad, abroad during your second year in Thailand, you need to apply for a re-entry permit before you leave. While searching facts about the OA visa, I found something from a solicitor company I did not know before. In most places, they inform you that when you reapply for the visa, that you either need 800,000 baht deposited in a Thai bank, or at least 65,000 baht to be deposited per month into a Thai bank account. I think for many expats like me, that would be very impractical, as we all have expenses abroad. For example, my Thai health insurance is paid in Euro and also my tax payments. But there is an alternative. You can let your embassy write a letter to confirm your monthly pension and that will be accepted. Now to how I got scammed by international scammers in September last year. Last summer, China had not yet opened the borders after the pandemic, so I decided to go to Thailand first. I joined Thai Friendly, probably the last serious Thai dating site, but I did not care. I had some good chats and video calls with a couple of ladies for some weeks when I was contacted by a, gar a girl who claimed she was living in the south of France, well over 500 kilometers from where I was living. She did not look Thai, actually not even Asian. She claimed she was born in Hong Kong by a Chinese mother and her father was British. She said that her parents had died in a traffic accident in Hong Kong, not a likely story, when she was 11 years old and that she grew up with an uncle in Singapore. She said she went to school and university in Singapore and now worked for her uncle's fashion company doing marketing in Europe. I asked her what she was doing on a Thai dating site. A friend recommended it, she said. Anyway, we got, off, we got friendly and chatted all day and sometimes very late into the night. We used WhatsApp and I... I could see it was connected with the French number. We also had some video calls. One evening, she wrote that she had stumbled on the charging cable to her iPad when she got up to go to the bathroom and the iPad had fell on the floor and was broken. 
She then sent a picture of, of a broken iPad. The next day, she asked me if I could do her a favor. As her iPad was broken, she asked me if I could log into her Bitcoin account and help her to do some trading. I was hesitant at first, but thought what harm can be done by logging into her account? So she gave me her login details and I logged into her account. Apparently, she had deposited 20,000 US dollars into her account. After following her instructions and after a few minutes, she had made a profit of 20% equal to 4,000 US dollars in cryptocurrency that I helped her to transfer to her crypto wallet. How did you, kn how did you know you would gain 20%? I asked. Oh, I just follow instructions from my uncle in Singapore, she replied. The next day, the same procedure was repeated, but instead of $20,000, she invested $30,000. Of course, I was tempted to open an account myself, and she said she would help me regain the money I lost by building a house in Isan, a classic mistake. So I owned a Bitcoin account and transferred the only cryptocurrency I had after the depression of Bitcoin at the time, only worth about $200 US dollars. With her help, I gained 20%, so the following day I had $240 to invest, so of course, I gained 20% again. Although I know that if something looks too good to be true, and all my friends warn me, I had seen with my, old, my own eyes that it had worked. Of course, she pushed me to invest more, so soon after, I managed to scrape together just under $5,000 and transferred it to my Bitcoin account. I even used some money from a credit card. Then I did not hear from the girl for 24 hours, so I got cold feet and I tried to withdraw the, the money. Yes, you guessed it, it was gone. The website was very professional and even had a customer service number that I contacted. They replied that as I had made an investment but no trade and they considered it as money laundering and would inform the IRS in the States. I said that it's got nothing to do with me as I am only liable for tax in France and not the US. Then they said, if you deposit a further $10,000, we can release your money. So I asked for the official company name and their registration and where the head office was. I did not hear back from them for a while and they referred to a Bitcoin company in Japan. I googled and found an email address for the Japanese company. The following morning, I had a reply in my inbox. It said that we are the only legitimate company in Japan. All others with similar names are a scam. And anyway, we only take investments in yen. After reading that, I was 100% sure my money was lost forever. I informed the fake company and the girl that I was going to the police. From a friend, I was informed that for frauds under $5,000, international fraud police will not intervene. In my case, it was just under. After this, the girl kept bullying me via WhatsApp as it was not enough that she had stolen my money. How is it going with your so-called police report? You can never catch me, haha. -ha. She kept on for quite a while. I checked up the two French telephone numbers she had been using. One was a virtual telephone number. She could be anywhere in the world. Also, the apartment I saw during our video calls could be anywhere in the world. Of course, she removed her profile on Thai Friendly, but I saw another profile on Thai Friendly with pictures of her wearing the same bathrobe in the same bathroom, now claiming that she's in the USA. Well, it's a, it's a classic scam, isn't it? You know, I mean, uh, that's what they do now. They're, if you're not familiar with it, they'll go on to uh, not just Thai dating websites, put a picture of a pretty girl on there. Some guy who's looking for a, a partner or just a date, you know, sees a picture, thinks she's nice, gets talking. Uh, and, and it's the classic one, isn't it? What she's done, she's it's not asked him for any money. She's done this. I would have been suspicious anyway. But, you know, why, if she's on a phone, why can't she do it on a phone? You know, any crypto uh, currency account, well, you can look at it on the phone. You can, uh, I, I'm sure you can, I've never invested in cryptocurrency, but I'm sure you can, um, you know, anything you can do on a laptop or an iPad, you can do on a phone. Okay, it's a small screen, but that's the first red flag. But, you know, I've got a golden rule that served me well for the last sort of 60 odd years. And that's, I don't buy anything that somebody shows me or somebody invites me to do something if i want something i'll go and get it i'll order it i'll go and buy it but i don't buy anything when somebody comes to me and offers me anything i'll just as a rule of thumb for me i'll turn it down just as a to stop myself being scammed and these bit count these bits uh bitcoin scams are so prolific now especially here in asia there's, there's um on the border of thailand they've shut 
one or two places down where they're, they're, they're just uh, they're just factories scamming factories you know so yeah you don't want to get involved in anything like that right okay uh, i wish we hadn't ended on such a negative point but the the email comment there that i read out earlier i'll be reading that out on my live stream tonight uh for other people who don't listen to the stories but that's it once again guys i'm getting shorter stories as always um if you if you're sitting on a story please send it in as i always say i'll change your names i'll make it anonymous and uh, hopefully you, you'll enjoy listening to your story that's it guys thanks again and uh, i'll catch up with you real soon.